Okay, Abby, do you want to get started? Sure. Okay, good evening, Thank everybody. You. And welcome to the second filmmakers discussion of this novel 20th annual JCC Metro West New Jersey Jewish Film Festival. I'm Abby Meth Cantor. I'm co-chair along with Andrea Bergman and Joni Cohn of the festival, which was founded by Karen and Herb Ford. We were seeing great positive response to the festival by mid-March, and then we were, of course, forced to change plans, but we're glad that mo most of the outstanding films on the original program are being made available to our wonderful audiences. The excellent of excellence of the content is the result of the efforts of the festival committee, especially our astute festival curator, Vicki Jacobs, and our tireless, talented director, Sarah Diamond. Uh, so, so thanks to them all, and a big thanks to all of our sponsors, including Care One, our lead sponsor, and our community partner, Jewish Community Housing Corporation, for their commitment to ensuring that this treasured community culture event, cultural event continues to thrive. And now an added thank you to our friends at the JCC of Central New Jersey. They're our new partner in presenting outstanding films to you, and uh, festival offers Offerings will also be discussed at the JCC at that JCC's film discussion Zoom sessions on Mondays at 1:15 p.m. Uh, and please go to jccmetrowest.org/njjff for updated information about uh, additional Zoom discussions for the film festival and any schedule adjustments, changes, additions, etc. Uh, so now I want to introduce. Our guests this evening, uh, Sarah is, are both of our guests with us? Um, I don't see Valerie, so, let's, okay, so we're so very I'll, happy to have Max here. I'll introduce Max. So um, now I'm going to introduce our guest this evening to talk about his miraculous work, Fiddler, A Miracle of Miracles. Uh, writer, producer, and director Max Lukowicz, Luk the founder and owner of Dog Green Productions has written, produced, and directed hundreds of works for network and public television, museums, and multinational organizations. Among his award-winning documentaries are works about uh, the Dance Theater of Harlem, Poverty in America's Inner Cities, Nelson Mandela's Struggle Against Apartheid in South Africa, and Hours to Fight For, Stories of American GIs in World War II. Mr. Lukowitz has written, produced and, produced, and directed exhibition films and presentations for museums around the globe, including for the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York, where incidentally, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish first played um, in New York. He has received widespread acclaim and numerous awards from, among others, the US International Film and Video Festival, the Chicago International Film Festival, and the National Association of Museum Exhibitions. His 2014 film, Morgenthau, which was shown on public TV, won an Emmy for Best Historical Cultural Special. Um, so, Max, is, are you there? <laughs> He's here. Uh, I, I okay. forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you'll have to carry the ball. But I'm going to come right out first and say I found this film so engaging and enlightening. The commentaries I found so informative Thank and you. thoughtful and insightful that I have a question. What must you have left on the cutting room floor? Must oh, boy. There are many aspects of the show of Fiddler and shifting themes explored in the documentary. I thought at first that the message was summed up in the phrase Janice face to describe the essence of Fiddler's story, but there are so many other themes beyond the modernism versus tradition track. And I was particularly struck that the performers, performers and commentators whom you interviewed cited parallels to the political and social situations that were and our hot button issues at the various times of Fiddler's incarnations. So my first real question to you, although maybe you'll answer my other question. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> I forgot people, it already. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who has a question, please put it in the chat 
box, which you can find the icon for at the bottom of your screen. Um, the film, your film, covers so much of the art and literature and personal backgrounds that inspired the creators and stagers and performers of Fiddler on the Roof. So my first question to you is, how and when did you first see Fiddler? And what did you see in it that inspired you to make this documentary? Well, uh, um, I first saw Fiddler on the Roof on, on Broadway with uh, Topol in the 80s. Um, and um, and I loved it at that you know, from that moment on. But then I saw the film, and even uh, it was more uh, moving for me. And what inspired me was here. Um, my wife Alyssa was working as head of programming for the Holocaust Museum downtown, and um, they were opening up the the fifth version of uh, the fifth revival of Fiddler with uh, Danny Burstein and, and, uh, and Jessica Heck. And um, I, they were doing a program where they brought the kids from the show down to sing a couple of songs on stage and all that. And I met Sheldon Harnick. And I'm always looking for a good storyteller. It makes my life easier. And he's a great storyteller. So um, that's the way it started. I just asked him, I said, this is a great story because it has a lot of la layers. And, uh, and he said, I'd love to be interviewed. And boy, did we interview him <laughs> a lot. So um, that's the way it started. And um, like, like everything else, you have to be totally immersed in your subject matter and passionate uh, about it, which, which I am. And, um, and you just keep going. Okay. Did that, that, was that, did, I don't know, maybe I didn't answer the question right. Okay, let me see if, we had a question. Um, actually, someone's asking about uh, some of the interviewees looked younger than they would be now. But actually, what I paid, noticed was that Joseph, Joseph uh, Stein, who died in 2010, is uh -huh. with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, so obviously it was more than 10 years ago. Um, can you describe the circumstances under which they were put together or any of the other people that you didn't interview now or you know, to make the film specifically, but that you found archival information, archival interviews? Um, we, when, when I, whenever I do a film, um, it's very important to have uh, as many real people telling you about their experiences, no matter which way you do it, especially in historical films. Um, and, uh, you know, we just asked people, uh, various people, and I, I thought who would be interesting to, to speak to. And um, I know that, uh, for example, Lynn loves Fiddler on the Roof and he loves Sheldon Harnick. Um, but ev everybody uh, who, who was in it um, said, absolutely, I, I'd love to be part of it. It's one of my favorite all time Broadway uh, film, uh, shows. And, um, and we even brought Chaim uh, Topol from Israel um, to talk about uh, the film and his, his presence in the film and both in the show. So we just gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered and I think we got everybody in, just about everybody in who we asked, but some are shorter than others. And what was the Lynn manuel Miranda and Joseph Stein, when was that from? Uh, Lynn Miranda was a couple of years ago. Um, Joe Stein um, passed away, I think it was either 2010 or 2011. 2010, um, right. 10, uh, it was within a couple of, months of um of uh you know jerry robbins I, it, it's funny the the uh the two people who who were very involved with it um were all gone and it's very difficult to sort of find the material but there was a wonderful film made about jerome robbins 
um, and uh, for PBS, uh, and we found uh, early material with Sheldon, um, uh, Joe Stein, and and um, and uh, Jerry Bach. Oh, Jerry, Jerry Bach. Bach. I'm sorry, he always gets put aside. He was just a wonderful musical composer. No, and and Jerry Bach, and they were very very funny and. Looking at the material was uh, was wonderful. So I get involved with the material, and it doesn't matter whether they're alive or not. You get something from the person. I'll tell you a funny story, just a quick thing. I did a lot of films on the Holocaust, and when, when I did the court exhibit for the museum downtown, uh, I had watched a, a thousand interviews with Holocaust survivors. Uh, which was very tough, and it took a number of years. But some of them um, had been filmed for uh, Louder Institute. There were different places, and they didn't know who I was. And I would meet them at a screening or something, and I'd walk up to them and I'd say, "Hi, how are you?" Uh, and they didn't. They said, "And you are." Because I was watching them spill out their lives and telling telling the personal stories, but they didn't know who I was. So I was like this man behind the mirror um, in it. So, um, yeah, people are the most important thing in any film. Um, we have a question from somebody who, you know, Hamilton, of course, very famously is now being streamed. Uh -huh. um, uh, there, there was such a connection between uh, Lin Manuel Miranda and the show. I mean, the, the bit from his uh, wedding is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any relationship between these two shows? I I'll tell you that when you talked about circles, that to me that seemed to have be something in common. But I'll let you answer that. Well, um, Lin's. Uh you know, really wonderful classic um, um, in the Heights. He s spoke to me, he said he wrote it based on Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and um, he was always involved um, with uh, Broadway musicals and uh, Fiddler is one of his great uh, favorites. And he became very close to uh, Sheldon. And um, funny enough, my neighbor here, I live on Columbus on the Upper West Side. My neighbor here um, was Lynn's uh, musical arranger in Hamilton and in, in the Heights and all sorts of different things. And um, one day I'm coming in the elevator and I said, um, how can, you know, it's midnight. What do you, what do, you do <laughs> for a living? And he said, well, uh, I'm a... Um, the musical conductor and arranger for Broadway shows. And um, so I said, which one? So he said, well, the one I'm working on now is called Hamilton. At that point, I didn't know Hamilton very well. It, it was, I think, at the public. And he was uh, fantastic. And I had a whole bunch of kids from Thailand here in my apartment. And he came up and we sang all these songs from Fiddler and from Hamilton. Uh, they, they had put on Fiddler on the Roof in Bangkok, and uh, it, it was like heavenly, so. Which kind of ties into a question someone's asking, I think you may have just answered it, uh, who was really moved by the um, interviews with the people who were putting on the show in Thailand and Japan. Were those people interviewed specifically for your film? Um, yes. And, and yes. wow. You didn't coach them, did you? They really had wonderful things to say. Well, you know what? If you're passionate and you like something, you you just explode with your ideas and all that. And and uh, and they, um, the Thai kids specifically, they and they come to visit me uh, each year. Um, they're they're just so wonderful, and uh, I have a piano here that. My daughter doesn't use, but um, she's 30 now, so she's out of the house. Um, 
and they were playing these songs and it was outrageous. I, I was using my phone and taping them and Sheldon was, uh, Sheldon came over because he lives very close by and uh, he, and they were playing, you know, far from the home I love and, and here's these Thai kids, you know, who are singing beautifully, singing all these songs and then they played a whole bunch of Hamilton uh, music. Wow. So, so memorable. New York, New York. I hope yeah. we get back to where we partially were. Uh, um, was there anybody that you wanted for your film who you weren't able to get? I, I, not able to get means they were either said no or they were dead. Um, I wanted to get Zero Mostel, though he would have messed up the whole interview, but of course he, would, he had passed away many years ago. Um, but no, I, I got um, everybody who I, I asked for um, loves the show so much they wanted to talk about it. So it was, uh, you know, um, it, it was not that difficult it's just when you ask people and you say to them this is what i'm doing and they feel that you're not taking advantage of them they will go along with it so um and it's all art we're all in the same boat we're all looking for the same thing all of us you me everybody um when i asked before about the cutting room floor uh besides what you couldn't use in your film um, I just wanted to tell our audience, because we're here in New Jersey, and I was just intrigued by the fact that Mark Aronson is a professor at Rutgers, so I just looked him up, and what a fascinating story about his father, who was the set designer, but his whole family, and, and I just would encourage everybody, do a little bit more. You can do a film on him alone, on that family alone. It's, uh, oh, uh, Mark Aronson is, is amazing. He's a real academic. And uh, he's brilliant and very, very uh, sweet man. And he was showing me all the sets. Of, we filmed all the, the the original sets that Boris, his father, had made. He has them in his house. We we did. There was just too much stuff for us to put into everything. You know, we just didn't have enough um, space. You know, it had to be an hour and a half film. So. So um, somebody is asking what you know. The I guess the question that you. People always ask, do you have a favorite uh, Tevya? Actually, uh, my wife calls me Tevya. <laughs> but, um, and I call her Golda, so that's okay. That's not her name. Does she love you? Yes. <laughs> I, didn't you see at the end of the film, I left a credit. I said, do you love me? And uh, I put in Alyssa Cohn and then uh, Valerie Lett for her husband, uh, Henry Reich and so it's right at the end of the film it says do you love me and there's the two titles my favorite Tevya you'll be surprised who would you think it was well who was your I'd like to open Tevye? this up I happen to love the film I think Topo I saw Harry Goes mm -hmm. on Broadway um, Zero Mastel I saw Do Numbers from the show, but I thought it's one of the best translations of a show to a film ever. And I think mm -hmm. Topol was marvelous in his, he, ha he made it his own. He made yes, it. Yes, he did. He did. He, he was playing in, in London beforehand and, and he actually played it in Hebrew in, uh, in Israel in 66. The show opened in New York in 64 and then um, he played in 66, but he didn't speak a lot of English. And uh, so he did the whole thing in Hebrew. And um, uh, I'll tell you who my favorite is, and you'll be surprised. It's Stephen Skybell. Who is Stephen Skybell? He was in the Stephen's... film. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, he was in my film, yes. Yeah. But Stephen is the Yiddish fiddle, uh, Tevye in the um in the show that was just playing off broadway and um 
he, he did the whole thing in Yiddish. Though he doesn't speak Yiddish, he, he says he's a nice Jewish boy. I was the only Jewish boy from Lubbock, Texas. And he learned how, uh, with Joel Gray, he learned. Joel didn't speak Yiddish either, and I do. So um, I, we were joking around, and um, I think he gives it the most. If you ever watch it, and there, I, we have it all recorded, you know, filmed ma from with many cameras, but because of um, actors' equity, we 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 ran into some issues about who gets paid what and all that. Anyhow, Stephen is full of soul. He's the closest. Uh, Nishuma that I could connect to to uh, Tevya, and um, and his responses to to statements. And when I heard him say certain words in Yiddish that I heard my parents say, um, it just like gave me the giggles. <laughs> so, uh, right, I saw uh, it as well. Now uh, I speak Yiddish fluently. Yeah. What's that? Did you have any connection? Did, are there any, um, I, I know it was produced in Yiddish in Israel years ago. Um, was there any connection to that production? Are there any films? Well, well the, um, the translator who did the, uh, the, the show uh, in Israel was a Holocaust survivor. Um, boy, I'm getting old. Um, I forget. You have to look him up. But I'll Google he, it. yeah, uh, he he was uh, he br he was brilliant, and he wrote the Yiddish version, uh, translated the Yiddish version, and um, he did it in a different way. Um, it was more. It had more religiosity. It had more um, Yiddish kite from. Eastern Europe, um, and, um, and and he did a brilliant job. And his family was there at the opening at the uh, Holocaust Museum downtown, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, when it opened. And they had come from Israel to um, to watch it, and they were thrilled uh, with it. So, yes, Stephen Skybell is brilliant, and I love him. And I introduced him to Chaim Topol. And I have this great image of the two of them holding each other's shoulders. The two Tevias. Um, what did you think of the um, 2016 version on Broadway? Um, I liked it. Uh, I like Bart Sher as a director. Um, I, I, I loved South Pacific, the way he did South Pacific. I, the, he tried to do s so many different things. He wanted to bring it into a modern age. In fact, um, I just found out that um, he, he had the, um, uh, the, sh the show start with a little boy in a modern time, and then he sort of moves away or something, and he becomes... Um, uh, he, he becomes Tevya. Um, but Sheldon was very adamant that, that he, he couldn't take it that far, so he just has him in the red coat. Um, I liked it. It's not my favorite all-time uh, version. Uh, I won't say anything bad about Bartlett Share because he's probably the best Broadway director uh, around. And... Um, and uh, it was good. It was, you know, it was fun to watch. And, you know, um, what did, did you like it? I didn't see it. <laughs> I saw the what? Yiddish version. But a How lot of you, What kind of journalist is this? Uh -huh. You don't see it? It's like not reading Trump's book and saying, oh, this was a, you know. <laughs> Next time. Next time. But a lot of our, you know, there was a question from an audience member who liked it very much and found it one of the... Uh, better, truest, uh, rang truest, she said to her. So I'm passing that along. I love the Yiddish version and I love the movie and I love 1965, I guess, or 66 was Four. where he goes. And he was great. I loved him. Of course, I was very young at the time, so. 
Yeah. Um, did you interview anybody who, um, like I thought Sheldon Harnick saying that he was afraid somebody would accuse him of stealing from Shalom Aleichem, the lyrics, and that shows you that they were really trying to be authentic. And we saw from the Yiddish version, they had to change if I were a Rothschild to if I were for, for well, in the original Yiddish one, it was if I were a Rothschild, which is what would the expression would have been in Eastern Europe in the shtetl. Um, but was, and did anybody question, you know, Fiddler on the Roof became so much, so quickly part of our pantheon in the 60s and 70s. And there wasn't a Jewish wedding where they didn't play sunrise, sunset. And I think some people who may not have been paying attention think it's a prettified version of life in the shtetl. Um, did, was there anybody that you encountered who thought it was it lacked authenticity from the Shalom Aleichem stories? No, uh, I did get some people who were uh, Trump supporters that uh, got a little annoyed for me putting in some visual political images, um, which I, I have to do. Uh, it's in my DNA, and um, but nobody uh, nobody says this wasn't real, um, because you know you could make a, a Broadway show about Neanderthal man and ha you know and write wonderful music and <laughs> and stuff like that. We don't know what what Neanderthal man did in his cave. <laughs> oh, we can guess, I guess, but. Um, no, people write musicals about a million different uh, subjects. Some are bizarre, you know, in terms of what they think about. But Fiddler on the Roof was a tough one to get sold, but um, it's lasted. It's a winner. It's, it's a winner. And it will be forever. Okay. Anybody else with questions? A lot of people are commenting because they love the movie, they love the show, they're reminiscing about the show, and they loved your movie. Um, what's your next project? Um, what's my next project? Um, I do, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of things, but um, the one that I'm working on, I have to get a proposal in for, it's varied. Um, it, for the American Battle Monuments Commission, uh, about a cemetery in, um, in the Netherlands where American soldiers are buried, about uh, 5,000, um, including Patton and um, a, a number of other uh, people. And the, f the people in the Netherlands in, in the town of Magraden have sort of adopted these gravestones um, and bring flowers to their soldier every uh, year on their birthday. And it's, um, it's a story about how we connect to different generations and how memories, um, memories disappear if you don't maintain them, if you don't nurture them and all that. So um, that, that's going to be done in the fall. I, I, right now with this coronavirus, I, there was a couple of things I was supposed to start on, um, and everything is just sort of put onto uh, a back burner and... Um, a virtual reality thing that I'm supposed to be doing in Florence, but um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So, um, does no. anybody? <laughs> yeah. So, a couple of more questions have come in. Sure. Somebody um, was bothered that in the movie version, the barn was too fancy <laughs> for such a modest dairy man. What do you think? The barn was too. Well, the barn was uh, in the movie with Chaim. Yeah. Um, the barn was constructed at Pinewood Studios, and um, and Norman Jewison really wanted space to get the Jerome Robbins dancing out. And if you make it too small, you, you know, whenever you do a Broadway show, I mean. Um, Movies have to be realistic, but they don't have to be super realistic. Um, so 
he wanted to create a space for the dancers to do these remarkably athletic leaps and and all that especially during the bottle dance and all that um and so he needed the space and so he had to bring in both you know the wedding parties and uh musicians and uh and then he had to move the camera around at that time they were shooting with these big panavision you know um, 35 millimeter cameras and uh, he needed space so god bless him he did a good job <laughs> even if it looks a little too modern. So uh, we mentioned earlier about the main themes of your film, uh, highlighting the themes as you see them, of Fiddler on the Roof. And what do you think is the core essential message of your film as reflecting the show? Well, um, one, one of the, th there are five, uh, key elements, layers that I call them of the story, which I want to address each one. One deals with women and women's rights and these young girls um, saying, enough, I have to make my own choices in life. Um, one is dealing with the strength and the weakness of the family, uh, how difficult it is to keep families together. Um, the story of refugees, you know, we're all refugees from one place or another. And, um, and, and it just keeps happening, you know, wherever uh, we are. And, um, and the most important thing is uh, every good story has a very, very basic element in it of love someplace. And um, so th there's all these cross currents that play and we wanted the songs to relate to um, to uh, these cross currents uh, that they had. So, um, yeah, it 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 deals with um, the way human beings look at each other and behave towards each other, and and uh, and how we have to learn from you know Anatevka in nineteen o five to, um, I hate to say Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, anyhow. Um, what about the, I think this was particularly true at when it played at the um, Museum of Jer Jewish Heritage, which is in fact a Holocaust museum. Uh -huh. uh, you walk outside, This and it was during the height of the discussions about immigrants and some of the restrictions. Yeah. And you walk outside from the theater, of the theater, and what's staring you in the face? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, your mm -hmm. country, and it becomes so uh, clear that the people who don't manage to get to America or get out of e out of Europe, thirty five years later, they have little chance of survival. So, it was that part of your, um, just the Holocaust is something that was going to be hitting these same people dec a few decades later, not that much later. I'm well, sure. there, there's an interesting point. I'm going to have to get off in a couple of minutes because I have to go to the other one, but here's a very interesting thing. Um, my mother was a Holocaust survivor um, at Beer Canal, um, and uh, I grew up with that, and I did a lot of films about the Holocaust. Um, there's a line at the end when they're leaving on Atevka, the family. And uh, Fiedka and, and um, what's her name? Uh, Chava. Chava are, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, there was, uh, I, so they're leaving and Chava says to her mother, we're going to Krakow where uh, people are more tolerant and all that. And I, I asked the, the people who made the show, I, who wrote it uh, and who got involved in Joe Stein's um, widow. And uh, I said, did he put that in to get the people who knew what was going to happen in Krakow 35 years later? 
um, because there's no mention of the Holocaust anywhere uh, in the show. Um, and and there, there isn't any place where it sort of relates to it, but the violence against the Jews, of course, we, we relate to it and all that. But um, I still don't know the answer, but I have a feeling that no. he did want to uh, make a, uh, a statement there that said, um, this, this, this young couple is doomed. They're doomed. Because they're going to be in Krakow 35 years later, so it's 1940. Well, I want to thank you very, very much. Very delightful to have you with us. And um, thank you for answering our questions. And even without your partner, even without Valerie Thomas. I, I don't know what happened to her, <laughs> but you know. But you did great on your own. So we thank you again. And uh, thanks. Thank everybody. Thank you very much for showing it. And, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. All right, and thank you all. You should, for those of you who are watching An Irrepressible Woman, you should have gotten your email today. And tomorrow you should check your email for Spy Behind Home Plate, which will have a Zoom on Sunday evening. Lots of film work to do. <laughs> Enjoy. Have a good night. Oh, and don't thank you. Don't forget the discussion Monday. Don't forget the discussion Monday, everybody. Film discussion Monday. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really wonderful to have this back. I really thank appreciate it. And the discussions, yeah. too. Thank you. thank you. So glad you could be here. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.